I want to talk today about uh, the human condition. I'm going to start off with a story from when I was a kid and living in Greece. I lived up the hill from a slaughterhouse. And my um, water fountain, the pump that I used to get water from, was down the hill halfway between my house and the slaughterhouse. And I used to go there every morning and fill up two large containers, and that was the water that I had. And one morning I was getting my water, and they were bringing a cow down to slaughter. And as it was walking down, it looked at me. And it gave me this look that no human being has ever given me, which was a look of total understanding, total awareness, and unbelievable compassion. The only thing I could equate it to would be Christ on the way to the cross. It knew, and it was feeling my pain. I never had an experience like that. And the next time, this was some months later, the water in the fountain had dried up. And the only place I knew I could get water would be in the slaughterhouse. So I walked down the hill to the slaughterhouse, and I walked inside just as they had strung up this cow. And they <coughs> slit its throat, and the blood just poured out. And the body went limp. And I saw this thing, and I don't even know how to describe it. It was like... tiny little spot, a principle, an identity, whatever it was, it left the cow and it went back into the atmosphere, one with the atmosphere and at that moment the cow's body went and it was dead. And I knew in that moment that that cow had always been this tiny point of identity, this tiny point, tiny point of presence or soul, whatever you want to call it. And it had allowed itself or had been brought into the world so that a huge body of meat could form around it to serve people, literally and figuratively. And the minute the consciousness principle left, there was nothing but meat remaining. I had been a vegetarian for years up to that day. That night I ate meat for the first time. I think most people see a cow being slaughtered and they think I'll never touch meat again. For me it was exactly the opposite. I understood why it had been here, why it had come into the world. And the offering that it was giving me and those of us who partook of its meat. Another story vaguely familiar or similar. I was in Kathmandu on New Year's Eve. God knows, 1965 or 6, 66. And we decided to, some friends and I, a group of us, to slaughter uh, a baby goat <coughs> to have for dinner that night. We, we had two of them, and it's a horrible story, and I won't, I won't get into it, because we were not, we didn't know how to slaughter a goat. And we didn't do a very good job of it, the goat number one. And it was horrendous, honestly. Goat number two, some passing Nepalese offered to slip the, its throat, cut off its head for us, if we, they could have the head, because they looked to that as a delicacy. We said, sure. So they went and they, with one very simple swipe, went, like that. We had not been so successful. 
The goat's head fell over here. The body fell over here. The goat's eyes were wide open and in a state of total confusion. The body was trembling separate from the head. And I kept staring at the head because it was so powerful. Its look of, what is this? What is, what's, what's this about? My hand is shaking here, see those of you who are watching. The body's trembling, the, the head is looking around, and then all of a sudden it saw something, and it went, and its eyes went up into its head, and its body, totally separate, went, ah. And it was over. And I could feel that the connection between the head and the body had nothing to do with physical anything. It had to do with something else. Because the body died at the same time that the separated head let go. So why am I telling you all these gory stories? Uh, well, for one reason, we're all on our way to the slaughterhouse. Whether you want to buy that or not, accept that or not, whether it's going to be as gruesome as that or not, I can't tell you. I will tell you my intimations of old age have been pretty powerful and, and they aren't pretty. <laughs> you know, it's all, we all end up in the same place. Um, what do we face when we get there? Well, you know, you can follow any religion you want to find out an answer that makes you happy. But mostly, mostly, we are not unlike the cow. This principle of consciousness or awareness or presence around which forms this material body. Why does this material body form? I cannot tell you. But I will tell you it formed around the cow so that we could partake of it. That it would nurture us. It would feed us. It would keep us alive. What's in the seed form? What's in the seed of a carrot, of a squash, a potato? What's in that seed? Something that grows that very body that we can consume. So it's not just about animals. Something in that infinitesimally small space within the seed has a life-giving property that brings the form into manifestation and we consume it. So why does it grow us? Why do we come into this complicated form? Again, thousands of answers to that question, and each of you probably should ask it for yourself. Clearly, we're not exactly consuming one another, although I mean, that's known, been known to happen. But we're here for some reason to be with each other. There's some reason that we give something to one another and we take from one another. And what is that? What is the thing we give and take? What is the thing we want from each other? Really? It's a tricky question, but I'm going to try to give a simple answer, and you can either buy it or not buy it, but we want something that in the simplest terms I will call connection. We want connection with each other. We want connection with each other because we need it, because we're nurtured by it because it comforts us, because it enriches us. We come to feel our own existence essentially in the reflection of and the connection to others. 
if you were sitting full bodied in a blank room with no one ever around you, would you ever come to know who you were? How would you come to know who you were? Would you become to, would you begin to think you were a brick? A series of planes of different planes, hard, solid, dense, cold. Would you have any sense of how to function as a human being? Would you have any sense of what all this was for? Of course not. You need others. And what's the thing that you need more than anything in the world? In the beginning, two things. Mother's milk, which nurtures, and being held. Being held. Connection. Sucking, filling yourself with this extraordinarily delicious, life-giving, warm energy of mother's milk. And the other is being pressed to the bosom of your mother. And when your mother is not available, anyone else will do. You want to be held. You want to be embraced. You want to be comforted. We all do. And just because you've become an adult human being, that has not changed for a second. What you have lost, unfortunately, is your mother and her ability to do that. Not all of us. You guys are here together today, mother and daughter. You still have that opportunity, but you can't be hugged in quite the same way. And usually there's a lot of complexity that comes into play in how you're hugged. But there is a purity in mother-child relationship that is the one thing we seek continually in our lives. And what it's really called, more than connection, is presence. In other words, being with another. Being with another is the most important thing in our life, and we live for it. We live to connect and be with each other, or at least one other. Being present with another person is the most nurturing, intimate, fulfilling experience in life. And we want it so much that we are willing to go through all of the awfulness of bodily existence to have it. And bodily existence is not easy and it doesn't end well. But we are willing to live through everything, everything that is presented to us because that experience of presence is so precious so desirable, so wanted, and unfortunately for so many people, so rare. Because how often do we get it? How often do we get it from one another? Once your mother stops cradling you, where do you go for it? Well, of course, there's this enormous drive towards sex. Sex and intimacy is probably the biggest drive there is in the world other than eating and sleeping. We hunger for that intimacy. We hunger for it. And one of the ways we seek it out is we seek it out because it provides us with pleasure, enormity of pleasure. But what we're really seeking, I know this may not be totally easy to believe, is the moment after orgasm. Intimate stillness with another. Pure connection with another. That is what people truly seek. It's not easy for many people to have that experience. For a lot of reasons. 
When you're a baby and you begin the journey into life, you begin to separate from mother, you begin to separate from others, you begin to distinguish yourself as a separate entity. That separateness is the cause of your suffering. It is what you are in the world, it's the only way you can function in the world, but the minute you become a me, the minute you become something that is defined in opposition to or in differentiation from everything else, there's suffering. And all you look for during that period is sex, food, sleep, and connection. That's what you look for. Acknowledgement. Sometimes you have a big need for it. You need to be famous. Lots of acknowledgement. Sometimes you're satisfied with just one other person looking at you lovingly. But let me describe for a moment what connection and presence is, how available it is to everybody, how in a certain sense it's never not available, and why it's so hard for people to get it. Presence is awareness of being. It is characterized by a sense of openness, truth, Simplicity, comfort, joy, expansiveness, oneness, wholeness. <coughs> These are all qualities of being, of presence. And we look to others for it because we don't always have direct access to it in ourselves. One of the things that leads people to meditate and to pursue a spiritual life is because they are starving to death in the world. They are starving to death in their connections with others. Nobody is giving them what they need, comfort, protection, presence, love, to a degree that will take care of their sense of separateness. So people who come to meditate want to find that space, that openness, that freedom, that sense of whatever it was they felt as a child. <sighs> and it's there. It's there. <clears throat> if you go into your heart chakra, if you sit quietly for a period of time, if you can still your noisy mind from rejecting everything around you and from rejecting yourself, from making all of these things that keep saying, I am this, I am that, which are the very forms of separation. I am happy. I am this person. I am beautiful. I'm not beautiful. I'm terrible. I'm wonderful. All of that separates you from everything. It's an I am something else. I am this or that. But when you stop that for five seconds, ten seconds, what you begin to feel is yourself, presence of self. And if you get really still, I've described this many times, there is this thing that happens in your heart chakra that it just goes and you enter into the portal of being. It's your true being. It's right there inside you. It is right there inside you all the time. And if you are able in your meditation to go in and enter that space, it's available and you can find yourself being comforted, loved, made whole by your own inner truth. But then you stop meditating. You're done with the class, you're done with the session, and there is all this around you. All these other people who make this very uncomfortable. 
how can I feel that when I'm dealing with all these crazy people? All these people who want something from me, who need something from me. Well, all I can tell you, and this is something I learned a long time ago, whatever altered state you ever get into, including your own presence, you keep coming back to this, other people. Sartre called other people hell. Hell is other people. Some of you may have experienced that. But, everyone you come back to in the world around you is a reflection of and a manifestation of exactly what you are. That presence, that thing which you are deeply inside and around which this body has assembled itself, is exactly what all these other people are who are you're looking at. They are your presence, this presence, which is not yours, there's no ownership of presence, they are the exact same presence in the exact same state of confusion you're in. The exact same state of alienation. And, and they have no idea how they got in a body, why they're in a body, what to do with it. And what they're looking for is somebody to connect with that will make them feel whole and complete. And those who don't know how to meditate will always, always be looking elsewhere for it. But if they haven't found it inside, even finding it with another person only suggests the possibility of what it can be. What you want is to find presence in yourself and then to find it within another. And then the two of you come together and as Christ said, when you gather in my name, I am there. When two people share presence, you attain the most beautiful state of existence imaginable on the planet. It is what we seek, presence with each other. We want to be one with one another. You don't have to have sex with everybody. Some people think that'll work. It creates more complications. What you want is to be present with one another, and maybe with everyone. Everyone. So here I sit in the class, having spent years working to discover and to uncover presence, working to be allowed to share that presence. What has happened for me is, is a remarkable thing, which is that presence has announced itself in a, in a sense a permanent way. Awakening is to the truth of presence. Awakening is to allow your person, your own self, your own ego identity to dissipate, at least for a while, and then to see this presence imbuing you and imbuing everyone around you and everything around you. There is nothing that is not made up of presence, nothing. And then, of course, your ego comes back and it works, but you know suddenly your ego is part of presence. And so presence is absolutely everywhere all the time. And you walk around in a state of presence. And I keep saying, how did I get so lucky to be allowed to know this? And I realized it took an enormous wish on my part, an enormous wish and a lot of what I call sacrifice. You know, I go back and I look at, you know, I had a job as a film editor at NBC and I... You know, I said, no, this is not what I'm looking for. And I left a very secure job, what seemed secure, and I went off to India and I went in search of teaching. And then I didn't find what I was looking for until I got back and I found a teacher who offered to teach me about presence, who was full of presence. And as I studied with Rudy, I had this extraordinary reality of being in connection with someone who had it and began to energize it inside me. I could feel when I sat with him, I was alive in presence. I was alive. And then what happened? He died. Plane crash. Boom. Done. Gone. Presence gone. But the amazing thing was, the day he died, I walked into the meditation room at the ashram, and I sat there and I realized I was full of Rudy. He hadn't gone anywhere. His body wasn't around, but I was full of his presence full of it. And, it. and it was there. And then it started over time to 
dissipate and I would sit and meditate and try to get it back, try to get it back. And some days I was successful and some days I wasn't successful. And, you know, and I started teaching. And the more I started teaching, the more I realized I could find this energy in myself and share it whenever there were people around who wanted it. And that was pretty wonderful. As long as there were people around who wanted it, it came up. I was somehow being used like a cow to provide energy to people who were sitting there. So they taught me how to do it. They, I don't know who they are, it, presence, showed me all these different things. And I could convey it with my eyes and I can also convey it with my hands. And you must be aware that that's how most people convey presence, is with hands. Have you ever, you ever shaken hands with somebody? Why do you shake hands with somebody? What do you think happens when you shake hands? You acknowledge, you acknowledge presence. You touch. Or you can even do this. You hold your own hands together and find your own presence and you do that. Why do you do that? Because you send presence actually kind of out of the top of your head into another. Benedictions are like this. Benedictions send presence. And you don't have to do any of that. All you have to do is be present. If you are present, you can begin to awaken presence in others. But, it's hard. One of the reasons I have other people teach here is to let each of you come here and learn what it's like to open to and be present with a different teacher. And a lot of you go, I don't like that teacher. It's hard for me to work with that teacher. That's exactly, exactly the mechanism you need. Because how do you open to someone who's hard or someone you don't like or someone you don't want to be around? How do you do that? How do you find a way in to the people in your life? There are people in your life you don't have to do that with. You can just say, I'm out of here. You can do that. But you have to understand the person you say, I'm out of, I'm out of here to, had within them a secret for you. A secret of how to connect with the person you don't know how to connect to. How do you do it? Rudy's example was that whenever he went to a cocktail party, he always went after the person he was least attracted to. Always. Why should I go to the person that's easy? Go to the person that's hard. When he had neighbors who moved in to his house and he looked at them and said, oh, they're different than me and, or, you know, and they're not people I would relate to and you know, all the problems we create with other people. Rudy said that the antidote to that is bake a pie and take it to their house. Bake a pie, you know, or a banana bread or something and make an offering. Watch what that does. Watch what comes back. What comes back is connection, presence an ability to touch and be appreciative of one another. That's what this is for. It's really what it's for. You know, touch is an amazing thing. You know, when you touch somebody on their shoulder, especially if they're going through a hard time or on their back or on their chest, it's freeing, it's liberating. You can even stick needles in people and actually achieve connection because it's connecting. It's connecting. So. Our job is to connect with one another. Connecting with me, I've given you an exercise, you know, a deep double breathing exercise and asking for help to surrender. I mean, it's kind of crazy. Why do I have to go through all of that crap to just feel connected to you? Well, that's a good reason for that. Most of us don't know how to connect. We don't know how to feel for another person or with another person. We are really disconnected. And we're with people all the time who don't connect with us. So you go out to a dinner party and you walk home and you go, what was that about? Why did I bother with that? What a boring night. I didn't feel a moment of anything real. Or you go out to dinner with somebody, you know, you go out on, a, you know, on, a, on an internet date, you know, and you keep looking, what am I doing here? Who is this person? Why am I here? Because nobody knows how to cut through the stuff to get to the real place. You don't know how to do it. You don't have to take a double breath. You don't have to hold it in your heart. You don't have to say, help me to surrender just to touch another person. It can work. It really does work if you're very blocked inside or very distracted, which is the condition of most Western human beings, most people. 
you really get so congested that you have to break through your own noise barrier to find that available space. I really spend a lot of time in this class finding my way into you. And each one of you has your own particularly brilliant form of avoidance to keep me from getting in. And I have to trick every one of you through various means so I can actually touch your heart. Most people are so terrified of letting go of their protective identity that even in a meditation class they can't let you in. And if you can't open to another human being in meditation, how do you open to another human being at the dinner table or someone you've known for 40 years and rarely had a moment with? You know, I've talked about, you know, in theater, in theater, the big moment in every play is when two people finally connect, somewhere near the third act. Why? Why are families that have such long history filled with people who don't say the truth to each other, who don't say the thing that needed to be said? Why? Because they don't know how to do it, because they're scared to death, because they're Armor, their armoring and their density and their conf conflicts are so overwhelmingly present for them that they can't find this gentle, sweet thing that's at the core. Mm. And you want it so much. You know, I have children, you know, and, you know, they each offer different forms of resistance and different forms of access. But I knew them when they were tiny. I knew them when there was no resistance, when there was no separation. I knew them when I cradled them and when Blanche cradled them, and there was nothing between us. And then the years grow on, and there's this density of stuff between you, and then you have to keep finding your way through that, into that place of this. And trust me, they want to go there. They want to go there. It's very hard for an adult male to say to a parent, particularly a father, I need your hug, I need your embrace. They can't do it. But it has to be done. It has to be done in some way, often subtly. You may not always get the physical embrace, but here's what you get. You sit with a person who you want to connect with and you open in yourself to your own presence. And you let the love and the acknowledgement and the comfort and the truth of that moment be present. You don't have to do a lot with it. You just have to be present with it and watch what happens. You really, <coughs> really and truly can find a way to be with that person. They may be talking about stuff that completely bores you, but go toward it. Don't go away from it. Go toward it. Embrace their dialogue. Be with them and watch what happens. This presence starts to fill the environment in spite of the density that's in between you. The sweetness of connectivity is there. Many people on the holiday season go home and they have this thing with their parents and usually there's, or with their family, and there's all of this unbelievable chaos and difficulty. Sometimes, however, and almost always, I suspect, there is one moment of like, this is what it used to be like. This is what it was like. You connect, there's a warmth, there's a beauty, there's a joy, and it makes the entire journey worth it. But all I'm saying to you is it can be more than that little momentary flicker of what was or could be. It can be that as a constant state. You can have a constant state of presence and openness and availability that brings you into a place of continual 
observation, of continual learning, of continual amazement, of absolute gratitude and wonder all the time. It doesn't free you from the human condition of suffering. It frees you from caring about that. You just go, it's worth it. It's worth it. Something about this enormously beautiful thing is worth it. You know, we had that horrible tragedy two weeks ago or whatever. The minute I saw it on the news, I turned off the news and I didn't watch the news for 10 weeks, for 10 days. I couldn't, I couldn't bear to watch it. It was too painful. So much of my own ego structure has fallen away that I have no, I have no defensive barrier against that kind of thing. And I just, I just said, I know it's there. I know it's part of the truth of humanity that horrible things happen. I can choose to enter or not enter into that space. But there are people who could not choose that. There are people who were in that space and, and were going to suffer with unbearable suffering. The loss of something or someone you love, especially a child, is truly the loss of the presence of that child. Only a parent can understand this. But it is unbearable to lose a child. And when that child's absence is filling your space, really what's happening is their presence is filling your space. I will tell you this, in the greatest of tragedies of that nature, the presence of that child will never go away. My mother-in-law lost two boys, two children. She never stopped crying about it. She never stopped talking about them. They were there to the last day of her life. I know this sounds horrible on some level, but I will tell you what's meaningful about it. They are your doorway to presence. The lost people in your life are your doorway to your own self. They will lead you into this depth that you cannot access with many other mechanisms. Finding that truth and ultimately opening to it and allowing it to be there takes you to a place of profound knowing, profound realization of the human condition. They know the human condition more than most of us. If you meet people who've suffered tragedy, they look at you differently. They look at you like the cow that I saw going to the slaughterhouse. They know something. They know it. We are babes in the woods looking for it, looking to discover what they know. You don't have to go through it that way. It's just one passageway. Another passageway is sit and really ask. Ask. Feel the willingness to let go of everything comfortable. I know when I left my job at NBC, when I, when I did all, when I left my, <laughs> I, I left my, another job at the Whitney Museum to go join an ashram in Indiana, I, I left a, to Calb, Illinois, not that I had anything there very much, but I went with nothing but my wife and kids into the world, into the unknown. Every one of these was an act of prayer, if you will, an act of saying, please embrace me. I will follow you and give up everything that separates me from you. That's what it takes. It takes an enormous willingness to give up everything and follow yourself. Follow the truth. It's what we're all hungering for, and it's worth it. It's worth it. It will not happen out of a casual, every so often, meditation. It won't happen just because you sort of think, you know, I kind of want that. You know, God, the universe, that which, which is, knows the truth. You can't hide your truth. It knows what you want and in fact delivers what you want. If you want superficial relationships that don't threaten you, it will give it to you in magnitudes you can't believe. If you want truth, if you want connectivity and presence, if you want to be freed of your illusions, it will bring that to you. That's what this is all about. None of you are sitting here because 
because you don't know what I'm talking about, that you just happen to be in town. You all know what I'm talking about. You do. You all know what I'm talking about. And it's really your call. What do you want and how much do you want it? What are you willing to pay for it? Don't come here week after week after week after week and say to me, I want it, and not take it. Because that's hard for me to deal with. You know, I can sit here with you forever. Rudy taught me about patience. Patience is a great thing. But ultimately, you have to get what you want. And I have to assume, in the end, that you've gotten what you want, and that we all do. The sad part is what we want in most cases is so small and so unimportant. I will tell you, having created a decent resume for myself, it doesn't have to do with the resume. I will tell you that. It doesn't have to do with your career. It doesn't even have to do with <clears throat> how many children or grandchildren you have. It has to do with finding yourself, finding your presence, finding your own being, and really opening to it so completely that everything that's not that falls away. And then you live a life of amazement, gratitude, wonder, and sorrow. Sorrow because you're in a world where so few people will reflect that wonder and gratitude and amazement back to you. So that's the human condition. That's where we all are. You're all somewhere on that spectrum. You have to kind of figure out for yourself where you are, what you want. But I'll tell you that the greatest thing to know, <laughs> the absurdity of all of this, is you are, as we speak, every one of you, present. Every one of you is already the thing you're looking for. Every one of you has it. Every one of you is infinite, eternal, and unique, and remarkable. Every one of you is extraordinarily real. And all I want is for you to know that. And all I want is for you to find that out. And when you do, all of the illusion, all of the crap, just kind of falls by the wayside, and you go, It's really, really simple. It's really simple. It just happens. But it doesn't happen if you aren't participating in the wanting it to happen. So, Happy New Year almost everybody. I know this is uh, another beginning. Everybody looks at New Year's as a new beginning, but nobody seems to really do much more than go to the gym for a few days, you know. But this is an enormous, enormous opportunity every second, really, to have a new year, a new day, a new beginning, a new you. And it's not, in the end, going to be really new. It'll be the oldest you imaginable, but it will be new to you. Because when you discover yourself, it's always been there. Any questions? Okay. Happy New Year.